Hello everybody, you're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry. And we catch up with Twang and Jack Ford over in the Oak Shed for a weekly album review. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for the Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. You can also reach out to me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. And I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people with MP3s, people with local arts news. Don't hesitate to get in touch. Wide-eyed, waiting for moments. He sighed, praying for time to heal. Do you care? Do you care? Waiting for moments, searching for words to try to find a way, find a way. She cried, choosing her moment. Searching for words to try to find a way, find a way.
That was Fortitude by Life Signs. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Danny Cobain. And it's time for us to be joined in conversation now by John Young of Life Signs. The first question is one you may or may not have an answer for, um, but it's my <laughs> traditional opening question. Uh, oh. And it's, what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Uh, strangely enough, I just reread Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, Very nice. Last, last week. Uh, I read quite a lot. And... Uh, you're just revisiting, really, and I found it not as funny as it was the first time. <laughs> but there were still some very valid points about the uh, the pointlessness of humanity and, and um, the Vogons coming and, you know, basically building a superhighway, which I think is probably not a bad idea at the moment, the way the world is. So Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, and that, and you know, uh, we're going to talk a bit about touring later. But I mean, do you take a towel everywhere with you when you when you tour? <laughs> Very good. No, uh, no, not 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 as yet. No, not as yet. And I've, um, but I'm sure I've met a few aliens on the way. So it's. Um... <laughs> Cool. Awesome. Well, obviously, today I want to chat to you about uh, life signs. And I wondered, mm. can you introduce us to life signs and let us know a little bit about the, you know, the band's story to date? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we're a very well kept secret, um, but we are. Uh, we started off in gigging in about 2014. Um, the album came out. First album came out 2013, and we've now had three studio albums, um, a live DVD. There's a Blu-ray in the process at the moment, an anthology. We're 11 years old, gigging wise, and we we gig, um, you know, in the UK and Europe and in. Uh, well, I, I would say in the States, but so far it's been cruised to the edge. Um, we've done that five times and we're just about to start playing in, with visas in, in America um, in October. So that's that's the plan. Cool. So, yeah, coming together. <laughs> and who who's in the band and what instruments do they play? 
Well, it's it's a it's a movable feast to an extent. I mean, the main uh, creatures within the band are myself playing keyboards and singing, uh, John Poole on bass and vocals, and Dave Bainbridge on guitar, keyboards, and vocals. And also, our sound engineer Steve is part of the band. Um, up, uh, I, I say it's a movable feast because we basically it's not our day job. You know, we mm -hmm. all work for other sort of artists, major and otherwise. Um, to make a living and so everybody kind of uh, flits in and out where necessary and I juggle to make sure that it you know we can do some shows each year um, that said um, unfortunately we we were working with Zoltan Chers on drums um, but that has just finished so we were very fortunate on the last cruise to the edge we had Simon Phillips playing drums for us which was lovely really lovely Cool. And you mentioned there that, you know, you, this is sort of, a, I suppose, a side project for most of the mem uh, the members. But you guys are all uh, kind of career musicians. You've worked with a, a huge number of artists. <laughs> I wondered who are some of the acts that various Life Signs members have worked with? Well, um, oh, loads of people, really, over the years. I mean, John's currently also working with the Wild Hearts. I work with Bonnie Tyler. I work with the Scorpions for seven years. Paul Rogers, people like that. Dave um, worked with Iona for many years. I mean, Dave and I have both worked with the Straubs. Um, I worked with Green Slade. It's I worked with John Wetton for 22 years. I was in Asia, um, all those kind of things. So it, it's a very incestuous thing, really, Dave. You know, I mean, we all bounce from one thing to another. In the end, there's just going to be four people left who form a band, I think. So that's, that's the way it's going to yeah. work. Yeah. Well, and, and talking of that kind of incestuous relationship, I mean, that kind of leads me into asking about some of the guest artists who you've had on your albums. Uh, mm -hmm. Who are some of the highlights for you? Um, well, I mean, they're guests, but they're also friends, really. I mean, Steve Hackett uh, was great on the first album. Taish Van Leer from Focus. Um, you know, we've had we've had a uh, Jacko Jacksick from King Crimson. You know, there's there's been all these wonderful people. Menno Hooches from Focus. I'm a big Focus fan, as you can probably tell, yeah. because um, they like what we do. We like what they do. Um, uh, so we've been very fortunate. I think um, you know nobody's ever refused to work with Life Signs, which has been wonderful. Um, and I think we're probably somebody said to me on the last cruise, we're probably seen as a bit of a musician's band, but we'd like to change that. We'd like to make it more, you know, with the help of your good self and other people, we'd like to take it to a wider audience. And uh, I think there isn't that, you know, since the days of the old Grey Whistle Test and all the things that used to go in the long distant past, there's not really much of an outlet for the kind of music that we do. And, and we, we need to, you know, make people aware of it. Because, for example, if you went to a Yes show or an Asia show, um, they play, or even Steve Hackett, they play Life Signs before the show. They play Life Signs in the middle of the show, but you don't know it's us. So yeah. we'd like to make a bit more awareness where we can that, um, that, that people know what they're listening to. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I suppose a lot of that comes down to uh, uh, word of mouth and uh, support from your your sort of uh, fan base as well. And I wanted to ask you about that because you know you've 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 had a kind of a, a kind of a crowdfunding indie approach to the way that you uh, you do things. Um, what can you tell us about that approach and why you were attracted to it? Is it as you say because it's th the way that there is for you to get your your music out? Yeah, I think so. It's also, I mean, you know. It's something that you have to have the patience to build with time. Uh, so when we first started, we were offered a number of record deals and um, they didn't seem like very good ideas. And people wanted to change the band, wanted to change what we did. I mean, it's not like we're a bunch of teenagers, you know. So mm -hmm. um, we sort of took a step back from it all and said, you know what, we'd rather do what we do ourselves. And so we, we, we basically decided that everything from booking the gigs, the merch, you know, the, the vinyl, it was all something that we would deal with ourselves. And um, our fan base uh, has been brilliant over that. I mean, the record companies thought that we'd last about a year. So I we've certainly outstayed our welcome on that point. And, and we even have now on the back of the T-shirts, it says Renegade since 2014, because we do like that approach. And we do think it's um, it's the way forward for people who want to actually make a living out of doing this, which is very, very difficult these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, you know, you mentioned they're making a living out of it. And again, the idea that you weren't you weren't expected to last. I think a big thing has been um, obviously over the last 10 years has been COVID. How did that affect yourself but also the other members as professional musicians and how were you able to keep going 
Well, strangely enough, it was very, it was a very dark time in terms of um, the day job, should we put it that mm -hmm. way? So we, you know, we all worked for different artists who all couldn't work. So basically, we weren't traveling around the world generally doing what we do, which is, you know, playing live gigs. Um, but what it did give us a moment for was to make the album Altitude. And yep. um, so we all decided during that time, as we weren't doing anything, that we'd just get on and make a record. Because to be honest, the government funding for you know anyone as a musician was tempence, you know. So it, mm -hmm. it really had to kind of dig in and do something positive during that time, which I think worked and I think helped a lot of people after COVID. I think um one of the things about our music is there is an element of therapy with it, which, you know, people gain something from it and, and, you know, it can help with lives. It can help with everything from illnesses to divorces to whatever, you know? So um, I do feel that um, that was a great time for us because we could actually concentrate on it rather than actually being, you know, doing a million things at once. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned there as well that kind of that therapeutic angle. And I did want to ask, like, is there or are there messages that you hope your listeners take away from your music? Um, <laughs> or is it again, is it just a kind of a case of, you know, you just hope they listen to it and it, it helps in some way? I think it can be anything you want it to be. We, we've described it in several ways. There's there's <clears throat> an element of common sense in the whole thing. So I'm not political and I'm not religious. I, I think, you know, for me personally, none of it works. And uh, so I like to just put forward ideas that might sound like, as I said, common sense. It seems to be, yep. you know, lacking a little. The storm alone lies screaming The ship's no longer sail She feels as if she's dreaming She looks into the gate one that's still away the only sound is water all around a wall of sea surrounds him confronting all his fears the seething mass sustained him a friend for all these years
you know, you guys, I guess you would, you would, <laughs> would you classify yourselves as prog rock? And uh, how would you, how would you even define prog rock? John has on his base, he has written um, destroy all genres. And I think that's a good thing. I mean, genres in a way are something that record companies made up to make more money. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Really, it's just got to be whatever you like, you know, whatever you enjoy. You can enjoy, you know, the Clash, the Sex Pistols, and Genesis. You don't have to, yep. you know, it really is an open book. And as such, you know, I, I feel we cross a lot of borders. We, you know, we are, yes, prog initially, but we also play pop. And we also mm -hmm. have an element of jazz fusion. And, and what's not to like? You know, it's, 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 I mean, I think, you know, I'm inspired by bands that, that break barriers and cross borders. And I think that's something that we should, we should never have to sort of just, you know, bow down to the record company. What, what the record companies think is the, is the way forward. You know, do what you want to do. Do what's in your soul rather than what you're told to do. Definitely. Yeah. Well, and I suppose that's kind of a key thing that you're able to do because of this kind of independent stance you've got as well. And I did want <laughs> to ask, you know, the, the fact that you're independent, you've kind of answered this. Um, but is there anything that could ever tempt you to no longer be independent to sign a big record deal? Or would you would mm. you rather be indie and, you know, have that creative freedom, but maybe have a smaller audience than, you know, quote unquote, sell out? <laughs> Yeah, I don't think the selling out is an option. And I don't think yeah. we'd have that option, actually. I think it would be unlikely. <laughs> um, but um, I, don't, I don't mind the idea. I'm not against the idea of, uh, you know, being more accessible. For one of the things that we've done is we actually have an album coming out with a record company soon, um, which is an anthology of what we've done. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we feel it's okay to release that, but we'd rather keep you know, what we're up to now to ourselves to an extent. And yeah. I do feel that, you know, unfortunately, you need to have 10 years of history for that to happen, you know. So yeah. you can't just dictate those terms, you know, straight away. But we do have an audience and we do have, you know, I, I mean, I have to say that our audience is is fantastic on both sides. Gen generally, you know, in UK and Europe and, and the States is is, is it's mostly found but i would say that they've been so supportive because of our independent stance it's been incredible yeah well and i like that as well i mean it sounds like you kind of get the best of both worlds there where you know moving forward in your current project you can keep that independence you can do what you want and then with something like an anthology it's very much you know that's just documenting that something that's happened. So it's kind of mm. like they, you can't mess with that too much. I, gu I guess they could say we want to do new mixes or something like that. But even then, there's only so much you can fiddle around with when you're documenting something that's already happened. Kind of, yeah. I mean, history is history. But I mean, we'll probably add one new track to that to make it interesting, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for everybody that's, but obviously for the collectors, that will be something to buy anyway. But I do feel that. Um, one of the problems with being independent is that a lot of doors are shut, you know, yeah. so you will find that there's gigs you can't do. You'll find there's shops you can't be in, you know, um, charts, are pretty, you know, it's very difficult to get stuff into the charts. Um, mo you know, so many options are closed if you take that route. And we only found that out by taking it. You know, it, yeah. was, it wasn't something we were aware of before. We, oh, we can do this. You know, we can put it yeah. on Amazon. All of a sudden on Amazon, it's like £40 for a CD. And you go, we, we, we're not charging that, you know. Yeah, so you where's realize, that money going? Exactly. So you realise that there is a kind of, um, I don't know, Illuminati that will stop you from, from, from moving forwards at your own pace. But I think in the end, if it's strong enough, you can't deny it. You know, and that's yeah. that's the beauty of it in the end. So we just become a thorn in people's sides. <laughs> <laughs> nice, awesome. And you mentioned again that the anthology is gonna gonna potentially have a new song on it, and you've worked on, you know, what is it three albums now? And I wonder like how does the songwriting approach come across? Do you have like a primary songwriter? Do different people chip in with different ideas? What does it look like from start to finish for you guys to to write a new song? Well, it, it's pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, that's my job is to write the song. <laughs> and, um, so we all agreed on that. Everybody tells me to do it. So I don't really have a choice. Um, so I put a template together of what I think something is going to be over a period of time. And then gradually that goes out to Dave and John and Steve. And I say, you know, do whatever you want to do with this. What do you like? What don't you like? In fact, one's just gone out before, before I uh, got in touch with you this evening. So 
um you know and they can they can yay or nay everybody's equal in terms of you mm -hmm. know we can say i don't like this I don't, i'm not interested in doing that you know it's very much um open house for everybody and um that's the way that we've always wanted to run the band because it's fair you know uh, yeah so yeah so that's the way well uh, and, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why you're still going after sort of nearly 10 years as well <laughs> yeah i think it could be I, I i do think um you know we've been very lucky a lot of people i mean i, I am thoroughly thrilled to be surrounded by amazing musicians mm. and um, you know that's all i ever wanted to do since i was a kid so to, to actually get to work with these people you know unlike with the crews this this year you know with simon i mean simon's played with toto and the who and everybody else and, you know but he likes what we do and, and it's almost like we've gradually clawed our way up to a situation yep. where we can talk to these people face to face and go, this is what we do, you know, which is yep. great. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So I want to ask about um, live and performances. Um, mm -hmm. One of the questions that, that I'm, I'm interested in is like, how do you manage to bring everybody together? Given how busy everybody is, you've all got different touring schedules. How do you manage to kind of carve out time <laughs> where you can all be together, not just to, to perform live, but also to practice and things as well? Well, to be honest, Dave, I'm, I'm a champion juggler. I really am. <laughs> um, but it's it's sometimes difficult. You know, you look at dovetailing, you know, and somebody will just be coming back off a tour as someone else is starting a tour or going into yeah. recording or whatever. And really, because we are at the bottom of the pay scale, you know, we have to take whatever we can when there's a gap. So yeah. that's what I try and do. And the boys are great because, you know, if we find a gap and nobody's booked it at that point, then we'll we'll go for it. And if yeah. something comes in the last minute, we'll dep out what we have to do normally. Uh, and so in a way, I mean, it's difficult. It's more difficult now. Once upon a time, when we first started the band, we all lived in Leighton Buzzard, you know, right. which was fantastic. Now it's, um, you know, our guitarist lives in Baltimore. You know, John lives in Cardiff. Um, our last drummer, Zoltan, lived in Sweden. You know, so yeah. getting everybody in one room. I mean, when we played America last uh, time before last, I remember just everyone arriving in one room from flights from all over the world and you suddenly go yes <laughs> you know because it's such uh, a relief to actually yep. get the, log the logistics of it together so yeah it's pretty difficult but if you stick with it you can do it yeah it sounds like you should start like doing your gigs in airports <laughs> yeah well we spend so much time in airports it's unbelievable but yes yes good idea um i'm not sure they'd be up for it sadly <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool and speaking of performing live do you have any particular favorite tracks that you enjoy performing live maybe maybe the most or, or more than others i think um in, in recent times shoreline and fortitude have been two of the tracks that we've really enjoyed because it kind of shows you know um i think with uh, fortitude there's there's definitely this sort of bigness of you know where prog could go at the end of it and i think with shoreline the um the jazz fusion section at the end we just all really enjoy playing it you know um so yeah i mean those, those are two that stick out for me and i think with the audiences when we do last one home i mean they can all sing along to that and um that's always a beautiful thing to see when you're when you're on stage mm -hmm. and you look at people singing it's fantastic wonderful Cool. And this is a very, very broad question. Um, but how would you say the music scene has evolved throughout the years you've been active? So maybe break this up from, you know, your early career up to the, the launch of Life Signs and then also since Life Signs begun over the last 10 years or so. It's a much longer conversation in a pub, I think, that one. Um, <laughs> it's, well, to try and put it as quickly as possible. I mean, I think, you know, every musician starts off wanting to be... Um, maybe fame is part of it but it wanted to be heard you know mm -hmm. and the i think back in the day you know when i was a kid and i am quite old um you know it was a lot easier to be heard and um yeah. there were less barriers um i mean djs could could play you know what they wanted to so you know you i could ring alan freeman at uh, uh, you know radio one and things like that and they'd speak to you um mm -hmm. Gradually over time, these things have changed and everything has become run by, you know, the record companies and and, thing, and, and, and generally the business in general. So, you know, the, the chances for smaller artists and, uh, you know, independent artists, new burgeoning talent, it's very difficult. And I do find for me now, I think looking at, I try and go to see um, young younger gigs, you know, and we have younger people that are involved in, 
like Lindsay Ward, who sings backing vocals for us. She's in Exploring Birdsong, and you know they she plays. She, she's in a band, Sleep Token. You know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So oh yeah, yeah. Um, so there is a lot. You know, I try and seek these things out. But I noticed um, a friend of mine went to the Arc Tangent Festival the other day uh, in Bristol. And I was just Googling all these bands because there's all these amazing bands, you know, and I'm, wow, this is prog. This is, this is, you know, metal. This is, you know, folk. This, you know, all these different things that the older generation who could probably help fund these younger bands mm -hmm. don't know about, you know, and, and, and there really is a line. It's like, you know, there's, there's a line of people and we suffer with it as well. There's a line of people that just believe in yes and Genesis and Emerson, Lake and Palmer and all those things and don't look for anything new, even us. You know, mm -hmm. and then below that, there's all this wonderful new talent that's coming through. We've much seen it with great energy because you definitely have that the energy for it when you're younger. You know, and uh, I would love to see. It would be great to see an old grey whistle test or something similar come back and educate people about yeah. the you know, the beauty of the intelligence in this music. It's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Yeah, and so, even even just showing them what's out there, because again, I think. Part of that's maybe the problem is that people just don't know it exists in the first place. Yeah. And if they did, they'd really, really enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, I, I came back on um, when we did the cruise last time. I actually cruised home and I sat down. I mean, and, and the, this cruise is full of Americans who are all over sort of 50. And, you know, I sat next to a guy from Utah and I said, so so what's your favorite music? And he said, oh, Alex Harvey and Bebop Deluxe. You know, and I'm thinking, how do I get to you? How do you mm -hmm. know exist and it's the same for the younger bands you know um because generally a lot of people especially in the states because it's so hard to get over there with the cost of the visas and everything else now they don't think there is anything new you know yeah they, uh, the, the the channel the, the you know the radio channel will be like a brian adams channel a beatles channel you know <laughs> a kiss channel but mm -hmm. nobody's really championing what's coming through and there's some great music coming through there really is amazing music coming through yeah Cool. Awesome. And just one, there was two questions in one to end on. So it's, uh, <laughs> what have you guys got planned next and where can people follow you to stay up to date? Oh, lovely. Yeah. Um, well, we're at uh, lifesciencemusic.co.uk and um, we're on Facebook. So obviously the two easiest places to find us. We are that old fashioned. There is an element on Instagram. Um, but we, uh, we're generally doing some shows. We've got three UK shows coming up in November uh, after we've done this short American tour in October. Then um, I have to go and do the day job in Australia for a month in, in January, but then we gradually get back. Marillion have asked us to support them in Montreal, so we're going to be doing that. And then off the back of that, there'll be festivals and other shows during um, 2025. So I'm looking forward to that. Big thank you to John Younging for joining me. You're listening to The Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Bain, and this is Life Science with Ivory Tower. I still remember the look in your eyes.
lies when you told me lies. I trusted. Your back to the wall as you fall from your ivory tower. No one prepared me for what was to come. Can I still find my way? Can I still find my way home for all the love past be?
You're listening to the Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound and it's time for us to head over to the Ilk Shed now to catch up with Twang and Jack Ford, don't know why I said it like that, for this week's album review. Public Image Limited, the greatest hit so far. An ex-library CD I would have bought for a pound either in a library sale or at a charity shop. I had followed rock music from the simple energy of the Beatles' Please Please Me right through to the complexities of progressive rock. I had seen Frank Zappa challenge every musical and social convention and then seen the punks strip it all back to pure energy. I witnessed the beginning of the end of punk rock when I saw the last UK gig of the Sid Vicious version of the Sex Pistols at Brunel University. I and many like me had ideas of how music should progress post-punk but it seemed that Johnny Rotten had a different plan. Johnny Rotten left the Sex Pistols, reverted to his real name of John Lydon and formed Public Image Limited. I loved P.I.L.'s first single, but it was basically a punk record. However, it soon became apparent that it was intended to prove that they could make a commercial pop record, but were going to choose not to. I did not appreciate the early P.I.L. records. They relied on a solid rhythm to be quite experimental jarring and dissonant, with Lydon making little attempt at melody. It had elements of dub reggae, the robotic rhythm and swooshing sense of kraut rock, and a touch of Captain Beefheart-like avant-garde rock, making it sound at times like a London version of The Fall. There was even some Tchaikovsky and some exotic Eastern sounding scales. The CD is chronological and it starts to get more accessible. Flowers of Romance has a tribal drum and is almost like Adam and the Ants. And This Is Not A Love Song actually sounds a bit like a song of sorts. They peak with the song Rise. The guitars of Keith Levine are both powerful and driving but also in places chiming and sweet, cutting across the solid rhythm and often strictly underpinning the vocal line. Jar Wobble's usual deep throbbing dub bass adds interest to the robotic rhythm and Lydon manages to write a lyric based on an Irish proverb that does not just sneer but celebrates with an anthemic chorus. I was surprised how much more commercial they got after Rise as this was the point in the 80s that I stopped paying attention. The second half of this CD has real rock songs with not too much of the 80s production sound that I hate. There is a lot of guitar even with heroic scorching lead and loud drums and just a touch of sequence synthesizers and even some choral backing vocals. Songs and productions that remind me a bit of Big Country and Frankie Goes to Hollywood with one quite like Carter USM. This is very much a CD of two halves, an interesting start and a foot tapping sing along ending. P.I.L. The Greatest Hits So Far. Big thank you to Twanglin' Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to John Young from Life Science for being this week's guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. And we are repeating on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound to listen again. iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. It all helps. You can also reach out to me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I'm always looking for guests. Uh, if anyone's got anything they would like to share for the Rye Light Zone, I'm getting towards where I'm scraping the barrel now. So <laughs> please send me some stuff so that I don't have to write more. And uh, yeah, I'm going to leave you with one last tune. Uh, this one, I had a dream where this song was in it the other day. Uh, this is Mona Lisa Smile by Colin Upfield. I'll catch you next week. Yeah.
this thing. 